Welcome to the third installment of our Learn from the Expert series. I'm Thomas Wiki, and today we are talking with Liu M. Liu M is a software engineer in the edtech space who has been on the platform for quite a few years and gained a lot of experience that he will share with us today. Liu, welcome, and thank you for participating in this. Thank you, Thomas. I'd like to start us off with just hearing how long you've been on the platform, how did you find out about it? Um, so I, I joined the Contopian platform uh, in May of 2017. Um, I had uh, an interest in doing like more of quantitative work, much, even several years before that, like even like in 2010, I was like searching for some things, uh, if there was any uh, tool available to, to do these things, but I could not find it. And so I kind of tempered down, but then again, I started in May to just figure out some some way to get started on it. And then I was searching in Google and then I found a forum where they were talking a lot about Contopian and what Contopian offers. Um, and, and then I came to Contopian, tried a few uh, ideas uh, and I was actually very surprised that it was a, such a very uh, powerful platform with all this uh, data that they were providing from several different sources, doing all this pipeline and a uh, uh, lot of additional things that it would take like years, several years or even decades for a person to build on it on his own. Um, so then I joined the platform. I started just playing around with a few things um, and then I would uh, participate in the forums. I would just look at what everybody is posting, um, just becoming a little bit more active in the forums. Uh, that's how I, I, I came to know of, uh, plat of the platform, Contopian platform, and get started in it. So um, as we already found out, you come more from a software engineering background. So I'd be curious how you move from that skill set to, I guess, more the quantitative finance side and also what type of unique skill sets and edge you have uh, that you bring from that world and apply it. Yeah, so uh, when I was uh, in high school, like I would, uh, I would just noticed that I was doing very well in mathematics and physics. You, you just spend a little bit of time and then you'd, you'd be getting like very good grades and very good marks and then some other subjects not as good. And so I, I knew that I had a natural kind of uh, ability and inclination to just do mathematical um, problem solving. Uh, even when I started with my work um, after my um, Bachelor of Engineering degree in computer science, uh, in, even in my work, I noticed that I have like very good problem solving abilities. Like if it is a complex problem with n dimensions and people are like breaking their, breaking their heads trying to figure out where the problem is, I, like, I was able to like uh, come up with some methodology where they could actually figure out um, the exact source of the problem. So I knew that I had some some good skills uh, dealing with the multi-dimensional problems. Um, and uh, so oh, just while I keep working in my regular job, like it's more software engineering, um, I also wanted to do something that was uh, a little bit more challenging, a little bit more intellectually satisfying than uh, writing software code. Um, and so I wanted to do more data, data science kind of related work. Um, so that's that's how uh, I knew that I would, uh, this would be a good fit for me to, to, to do something that I also like, uh, as well as I might have a good talent for that as well. Yeah, that sounds like a really useful skill set indeed. So then I'd be curious how that skill set and your background relates to your research process. Um, so when I when I started at Contopian, I did not have a lot of uh, financial background. Um, but what I would do is I would uh, uh, I would just like uh, go to a lot of these uh, posts on the forums. Uh, I would observe like what people are uh, uh, posting there. Sometimes they they would link um, link some papers. Um, I would go to those papers, see what those uh, researchers, what type of factors those researchers were using, what type of results they were getting, um, and then I would come back to the Contopian platform and just 
play around with my own ideas, like change things here and there, uh, try some new custom formula, my own uh, calculations, uh, those kind of things. I would just experiment uh, with my own ideas. So I would take the factors from the research papers and then just try try my own variations on it. Interesting. And during that process, what are some of the most important insights that you gained into how to do quant research? Uh, so uh, one thing I've observed is that a uh, lot of people, uh, there, are, there isn't like a, a dearth of opinions available. Like everyone comes with their own idea of this is how the market works, or this is what you should do, or this is what quality is. Um, and then I, from my own work, I observed that, you know, don't take everything um, at face value. Always try to do your own work and uh, and research. And what you learn from your own research is um, more valuable to you over time than what someone else is. Um, so that's one thing I, I learned that uh, do a lot of things, uh, trust but verify, so build, build your own opinions. Um, another thing I've observed is that uh, uh, sometimes like the end result might look um, very com uh, complicated to achieve. Like people might be posting uh, 2.0 or 2.5 sharp, sharp ratio algorithms and it might look a little bit intimidating to start with. But uh, if you try to uh, try to solve smaller problems at the beginning, try to create like one factor at a time, um, maybe even factors for specific sectors. And then you try to combine several of those small factors, then uh, the combined effect of that is that you get higher and higher sharp, and a lot of diversification, um, and it's also easier to achieve that way. So start, take smaller steps, and then combine the individual um, factors into a big factor. Another thing I've learned, um, is that uh, always follow good practices um, in your research process. Don't uh, take shortcuts, uh, use wider universe. Um, always separate the training and the test data set. Don't mix them or don't use the full data set for your training. Um, uh, so you should always like keep those things in mind. Um, and uh, another thing I've learned is that uh, diversification is very important uh, because uh, uh, as much as you believe that one factor is the best factor, uh, that might not be true uh, in the next two or three years uh, after you finish your research. And then you should always be prepared for that. You should have a set of factors that uh, that work together well. Like one factor is not doing well, um, the other factor might pull, pull a little bit um, and you get a kind of combined effect. So diversification is, in general works very well. Uh, when you're going into an unknown time period in the future. That's really interesting. Yeah, that all of that rings very true. Um, and then while starting out, is there any wrong paths that you took that maybe uh, you can advise newcomers on to not follow and uh, so any hard learnings? Yes. Um, so when I initially started on the Quantopian platform, um, like I was running a lot of back tests. Like I would come up with a lot of these ideas. Okay, I'll try this and that. And then uh, in the morning, I would start like 20 back tests. And in the evening, I would come back, take a uh, look at all of them, and then uh, note it down in my own spreadsheet, take some notes. Uh, but uh, I went through a couple of uh, videos on YouTube. Uh, Jess, who was uh, the managing director, she has uh, posted a lot of good advice. Um, and then one of the advice uh, she has is like, try to use the research environment. Um, initially, I did not understand that very well, but when I started using the research environment, I kind of figured out why that was good um, because the things work much faster in the research environment. Uh, the ID algorithm, the algorithms that take like maybe several hours, um, all those things you, can, you could do in the research environment within a few minutes. So you don't actually lose much uh, time-wise. In fact, you might gain a lot of time. You might uh, get a lot of flexibility in iterating over things uh, or trying uh, new ideas, change a little bit here, uh, see the result again. Uh, and also uh, it gives you a lot more information, uh, like 
packages like alpha lens, they give you more information and information is like very, you need to have an edge in the market and edge comes from uh, some additional information or insight that you gained. Uh, and if you like in a backtest environment, you merge all this information and you see just the final result, you might miss out on a significant piece of information that could have given you an edge and where you could have developed a different algorithm. Um, so that's something I learned. Um, in addition to that, um, what I realized is that uh, you need to be able to translate what you learned, uh, what insights you gain into an algorithm. And the algorithm, you have to deal with the pipeline output, which is a Pandas uh, data frame. So uh, don't get intimidated by Pandas and NumPy. Even if you learn a little bit uh, about them, incrementally, you can keep learning more and more uh, as you go on. Uh, definitely skills Python, uh, Pandas, and NumPy have found are uh, extremely helpful in translating your insights into actual uh, algorithm code. Interesting, yeah. All of that makes makes a lot of sense, especially using more, more of the research environment. <clears throat> so um, maybe then we switch to the more tutorial section of the video, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you have to show to us. So like I described, I usually like to go to forums, read posts. Uh, there was one post uh, in, uh, when I joined uh, June 20, 2017, uh, there was a post. Um, and then there was a couple of links to a f some fact. Uh, these might be useful links. So I went to one of those quality factors link. Uh, so this in this link, I saw that there were, there were references to a couple of papers. So I went to this paper. Uh, and I really like this paper a lot because uh, it explained the research methodology, they, how they were doing their research, what uh, statistical things they were looking for, uh, and what type of factors they were building. And um, so I went right away to the fact. Can you show us the top of the paper just to so we can see the author's yeah. And title? Yeah. So this uh, paper is from AQR. Uh, it's quality minus junk. Um, it's a pretty famous paper. Oops. Um, uh, and so, so what I do is that um, I go to these factors where they show these factors, how they develop the factors. Let me go back one second. Yeah. So here, if you see, so this is uh, gross profit over assets, ROE, ROE. Uh, there are a bunch of uh, fundamental variables that they use, a combination of those z-scores, um, and then they define their growth metric as a combination of z-scores, uh, uh, which is more of a percentage change in these same variables. They have some additional variables for safety and payout. So their metric of quality is profitability plus growth plus safety plus payout. Uh, so I took a couple of these, like I usually take these factors and play around with them myself. I try my own variations. Uh, here I took ROA, uh, this is here, it's a five year period, but uh, because they did on a 50 year research period, five year makes sense. But since we have shorter volume of data, it's I was going to try a one year period. So I took that uh, factor. Um, I tried to see how it changes in a one year period. Um, so I, uh, I created this notebook. Uh, so in this notebook, what I do is that, first of all, I separate the training and test period. Uh, so I have 12 years of uh, data that I train with, where I extract information, um, how the factor did. But then I always leave like a three year period, 2004, five and six out. Uh, so I don't use that data, but I will validate my factor on that data uh, at the end. Uh, that's, that's a really good practice, practice yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a really good practice and uh, you should always do that. The more you have that uh, uh, test period out, which is a little wider, it's better actually. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, now I'm doing this notebook. And that's mainly for presenting, for preventing overfitting. Right? Yes, for preventing overfitting, you want to know uh, if the information, uh, the factor that you developed can deal with the new market condition that was that it was never trained on. Uh, so once you know that it already is doing that, you will have a better confidence with that factor going forward in the future. 
uh, and also that you didn't find some uh, some correlation or something which was which is not economically viable so you will immediately know about that if it is a very bad factor uh, you will immediately come to know about it and if you overfit a lot of things you will also come to know about that as well um, so in in terms of my research breakdown what i like to do is like i like to do uh, like smaller chunks of time so even in the 12 year pre period that i'm training with i like to like divide it into like uh, four year periods uh, that way you get um, multiple market regimes like 2007 to 10 you had a recession and a recovery uh, and then 10 uh, 11 to 14 was kind of a bull market uh, 16 to 18 there were uh, considerable uh, periods of uh, consolidation so you have different market regimes uh, once you find some information that worked um, in different market regimes, then it's uh, it's kind of like uh, you have more confidence that that uh, factor might be more uh, robust and it will work uh, in future market conditions as well. So here, uh, what I'm doing is that uh, for the first four year period, I'm taking the alpha lens template and that factor from that paper, which is basically the one year change. I'm using a one year instead of five year. Um, then what I do is that uh, I do some data validity. Uh, I think in an earlier video, Vedran uh, Rusman as well mentioned that you should know your data. Like sometimes you might have a lot of zero values. Um, some value might dominate a lot and it might fill a lot of quantiles and then you'll get uh, information that is not invalid. Uh, so you want to know how much rows you have. So I usually print out this one uh, and then the value counts, like how many, uh, distinct values are there. So the largest value here is zero and it's only like 12,000 out of 1.7 million. So it's not uh, too bad. So once I verify that, I run the um, alpha lens. Um, and then what I notice is that, okay, the, at our overall QTU level, it's kind of a downward trending, which is not a good sign, which means this factor will not work at the QTU level. But sometimes you can go into the sector, like uh, individual sectors, um, and that breakdown is available here at the um, in the return steer sheet. Um, so you can look at the individual sectors, how they perform. Uh, so you see that basic materials, you don't really have a good, uh, what I look for is like an upward trending, uh, upward trending chart, so histogram. So if you, uh, if your factor is predictive, then it should have the lower uh, ranked uh, equity should have lower returns and the higher uh, rank, higher factor score equity should have higher rank. So if you don't find that, it generally means your factor is not very predictive. Um, and so I, if you look at it, like you don't generally see in any, any kind of thing where there is an upward trending uh, kind of pattern. So. So in this four year period itself, this factor did not do well. Um, but maybe what I do is that even if this does not do well, I like go to the fundamental uh, data set in Quantopian, they have FactSet and Morningstar and all of this. I find something closely related to, uh, to this. So I find a factor uh, which is closely related to this. So this was something else that I tried, uh, so I'm not, I'm going to show you the result, uh, what I tried, uh, something similar, but a different one. So here, what I found is that like, see in financials, you see like a good upward trending um, ranking. So that's something I like. Um, and then I note on, note on like which sectors here, even in utilities, it's, it's pretty decent. Um, so I note on these kind of, um, even if it, if it works in some fact, uh, some specific sectors I note that note that down in a spreadsheet and then I do it for three year period and uh, sorry the three four year periods that covers the 12 uh, training period 12 year training period um, and then this is just to illustrate uh, this was the original factor in the paper I did not find any consistent pattern over uh, the 12 year period a positive pattern but the factor that I change and modified, uh, I could find that in financial services and utilities, it was the 10 day return was uh, positive in each of the four uh, subsections. 
So that's and, that's. But you developed it on just one of those subsections, and now you see there's others here out of sample test. Yes, yes. Um, so this is the training period, and in the training period, I look for this kind of thing, consistency and uh, a trend, like a good. Uh, like it should higher score should have higher uh, weight, and the lower score should have lower uh, weight. So a trend is good, which means the factor is predictive. Um, and then this is like a more consistent across smaller subdivisions of your training set. Uh, it's consistently positive. Uh, so you have a reasonable amount of confidence that this factor, uh, this sectors respond well to this factor. So what I do is that um, I develop sector specific factors. So I can take these two factors and then uh, on the on my training period, which is 2007 to 2018, I um, I simulated and obviously uh, I get some good results because it's a training data. I, uh, it's expected, but then I also have uh, I also have a separate um, out of sample data 2004 to 2006 that I did not train train the the factors on. Um, so this is some new information for the factor. So I run it on that. A three-year period, and if I see consistent positive results, um, I'm reasonably confident that this this uh, this factor is uh, is viable. So I add it to my um, I then I develop a lot of those uh, factors, sector-specific factors, um, and then uh, one thing I'd like to do is that after I um, built those factors. I'll try to take a look at the PyFolio um, notebook. One so, thing I'd be curious of is how many of your factors do survive that out of sample test? Um, so it depends upon the type of factor. That's one thing I've observed. Uh, but uh, most of the time I find that uh, a lot of my filtering happens in the first stage, in this stage. Like uh, when I'm finding these factors, the things that I don't find are not uh, aren't any good. Are like more like uh, ninety percent are not good, and only one in ten kind of give you something. So you have to like keep trying a lot of different ideas, a lot of different factors to find uh, even something that uh, that gives you good information, like a good uh, result on some sectors, but. In out of sample periods, um, my observation is that uh, mostly like 65% of the time it kind of works. Um, but then it also depends upon um, like what type of uh, out of sample period you used. Um, I find that certain years are generally not very good for quantitative factors in general. Um, and in those years, uh, the environment also comes into play, uh, but in the particular period that I have, like for 2004 to 2006, uh, it wasn't like a, it was a reasonably good period. Um, and I find that like 65, 70% of my factors seem to survive that. Uh, but sometimes I find that they, uh, they survived that three year period and they're, they're reasonably good. Uh, but then in 2019, if I run it in the contest, I sometimes see that they're flat in 2019. So. We have to kind of um, try a lot, lot, a lot of factors before uh, you get things that are very good. Um, it's more of a, like a numbers game. You've uh, probability and numbers. You just have to try a lot of ideas. Um, so here in the PyFolio tier sheet, uh, I look for certain things, and uh, one of the most important things I look for is this returns. Um, I'd like to see like which year the factor is positive um, and which year it had the like the lowest returns. So, so what I usually find is that when you do a lot and lot of factors, you develop like you have your own library of factors. You see that 2016 was in general a period where you will notice that many many factors have like a flat or a negative return. Um, so when I see a factor that did very well in 2016 and did kind of positive in almost like 90% of the time in this small, but 2007, it had like a 3% drawdown. 
um, it's not it's actually a high value factor because you can find many factors that um, that did not do that uh, did not do well in 2016 but did extremely well in 2007 so i have like huge number of factors who did very well in 2007 so this this factor is kind of uh, very good when in the in sense of when you want to combine different factors uh, this will provide a very good diversification uh, benefit because it does uh, it's more orthogonal in performance uh, to other factors you might have found so that's uh, one thing i like that's really a simple and direct way of getting diversification benefit without fancy correlation um, computations. You just look at the different time periods and combine them that way because you know if um, if one is down in this year and the one other where the other one is up. I mean, yeah, the, by definition they will be anti-correlated, but this is um, just yeah a very simple way of getting at the same thing. Yes, yes, um, and you can also run like. Uh, find the correlation among several factors um, using the uh, backtest daily returns. You can find that out and very, um, when you combine uncorrelated factors that, that gives you the most robust factors because they usually survive um, better. Um, and I, one additional thing I found is that certain like dimensions seem correlated, like profitability, is in my opinion a little bit correlated to safety and even quality like companies who are earning a lot um, making a lot of income and all those things also tend to be companies that are safe that have like um, good PE ratios uh, things like that and then there are certain other things like growth verticals that that are kind of orthogonal because a small company can be growing quickly and then it could have a very high score but if on, on a profitability or safety metric it might not turn up that high but so usually if you combine like several orthogonal dimensions uh, in an algorithm that tends to be very very robust because not all dimensions go down at the same time so that's that's something I also try to take a look at when I'm combining several factors into an algorithm. Do they have like a robust component? Right. Yeah, so that pretty much explains, um, especially for, uh, for challenges, um, for the recent challenges where uh, like the 10K uh, challenge, third party challenge. Um, if you, where they say that, where you're required only 100 um, uh, equities in the QTU. So this is a very good approach. You can develop like factors which are specific to sectors. Um, and then you, you can combine several of these factors uh, across different sectors and come up with larger and larger uh, universe. Um, and also gain higher sharp in the in the in the process. So this this kind of works that way, um, very well in that way. That's really interesting. Yeah. So you're combining different factors that only are specific to certain sectors, but then you still get a large coverage by combining different factors from these different sectors um, into one large portfolio. Yes. Um, and then I'm also curious. So you mentioned that you often start off with papers is that your usual workflow where you take where you just read a lot and then take the best ideas and reconfigure and try certain variations of them uh, yeah so in when i when i came to quantopian i did not have like a lot of financial background like i had more software engineering background and so i was trying to figure out what the researchers are actually trying out in this area and papers like these are a good starting point you can see like what type of like they are interested in profitability and returns and margins um, or growth in these variables uh, leverage you know all this kind of additional financial ratios uh, so there are like a couple of papers that also talk about like taking a lot of these factors and doing some additional research on top of that and um, those things give me a lot lot more additional ideas to go with uh, but I start with these factors and I keep playing around. I, I do my own computation, some custom calculation that nobody would have thought about, uh, which are based on my own insights. Um, so once I 
started experimenting with these factors uh, using the uh, just getting an idea from these papers of what type of uh, factors I should be creating and then going into the data set, uh, like fact set fundamentals or estimates or Morningstar and then trying my own variations. Uh, sometimes like different data points look a uh, little bit related to what they were doing. So I would try those things. Um, and the most interesting factors and the best factors I would have actually uh, found for myself have come from my own experiments. Um, they were not some published factors, but they were from my own experiments where I tried a new formula. Like I was thinking, okay, I'll try a new formula for combining certain fields. Um, or I would um, try some different combination of fields or do some something on my own. Uh, and that's, I got a lot of good factors uh, that way by just exploring the research environment in my spare time, just trying different ideas. Great. Uh, well, Neil, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you, Thomas.